on the ground, but I'm not looking down. Feel the warmth of the breeze rushing over me. Touch the sky, feel alive. We can fly, we can fly. Touch the sky, feel alive. We can Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, Dee Dee. Hey, everyone. I'm Hillary. Well, I'm happy that you are here, my peasants and groundlings, my lurkers and lovers. Welcome to Hang with Hillary. Come on and let's hang. But first, give a roaring welcome to my co host, David Maldo. David. <laughs> <laughs> That roar is getting louder every week. And you can see we've got a special guest here and we've got some kittens on the couch. David, happy St. Pat Patty's Day. I can't hear you, your video's off. Oh, oh, oh sorry, there we go. <laughs> I didn't go green, but I've redone purple. Last week I was fading. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm freshly purple just for you, Hillary. I appreciate that. <laughs> You're over here. You're still over here this week. Thank you so much for playing our theme music. Uh, and you can see we've got some um, kittens on the couch. So kittens, how are you doing this week? You're hanging out, you're being cool, watching mice and rodents. They're doing their job. They're basically doing their job. But uh, really they're here because they heard we had someone really special on the show. And so, uh, tonight, you guys, you're in for a treat because we have the one, the only Joe Milner who is on the show tonight. Uh, but before we bring him out, uh, let, for those people who are brand new and just joining us, I'm Hillary and this is David. And hanging with Hillary is pretty much a journey through uh, getting to meet artists, filmmakers, actors, writers, composers, fashion uh, designers, and tonight, a sound designer, uh, through the journey of a career of a working professional in the arts. And it's not always a linear line, you know, careers zig and zag and take all sorts of unexpected turns. And David and I want to share some of that journey with you. It's been pretty good so far, right, David? We've I'm had, loving it. <laughs> we've had some great guests. And David does all the magic uh, through his Let's Do Video uh, magic. <laughs> Go, 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 David. <laughs> you look so surprised every time I do that. I love it. <laughs> I know. I'm the one who found the sound. And then, but you know, Joe, being our sound designer, could have designed something like that and put it in at just the right spot. That's true. Go, go, go. go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. So for... <laughs> Now you threw, I, I got to get this pre-show patter. I'm still working on it. It's only show number seven, but we're getting, we're getting better. Every week 
You know, that's the thing when you're trying new things. Um, so for those of you who are new, please hit the subscribe and to notify when we go live so you never miss a show. Next week, we've got a phenomenal um, uh, guest, Tate Tullier, who is a deaf photographer, business owner, artist, fantastic human being is going to be on uh, with a sign language interpreter to make it fully accessible and you'll get to see the magic of Tate. But uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, this week's guest. So please give a round of applause for our guest, the fabulous Joe Milner. Come on out, Joe. Hello. Uh, nice to be here. Hi, Hillary. Hi, David. <laughs> Thanks for being <laughs> here. Great sound. <laughs> I could use some some so sound designer uh, help, but we're working <laughs> on it. How many crowds have you done in your career, Joe? Uh, a million. Some like really <laughs> big. They're usually the big crowds are easier to do than the than the small crowds. When it's like five people, that's really hard to do. But five thousand, fifty thousand, that's easy. <laughs> So for those people who are not quite sure what a sound designer is, we're going to we're going to go into that in a bit and all your answers will be all your questions will be answered, I should say. But first, uh, just so you get to know a little bit of who Joe is, um, uh, he doesn't get to be interviewed very often, which shocked me, to be honest, because I think everyone needs to have Joe on their show. And he's like, no one ever thinks to invite the sound designer, which is insane uh, when you hear about who Joe is. So Joe Milner began his career in music and transitioned in engineering and film production before launching into sound for motion pictures. Over a span of 27 years, Joe has been involved with over 155 films. His credits include Das Boot, The Director's Cut, Vanilla Sky, starring Tom Cruise, Dogtown and Z-Boys, which won both the Audience Award and Directing Award at the Sundance Film Festival, Romeo Must Die, Wrist Cutters, which premiered at Sundance, Meet the Patels, Twinsters, Vito, I Am Divine, and the Academy Award nominated Last Days in Vietnam, and almost all of my films. So Joe also <laughs> did the sound design, edit, and uh, mix for See What I'm Saying, the Deaf Entertainers documentary, which we're going to talk about also in just a bit. But a Joe, for, for people who aren't quite sure, what is a sound designer and what do you do for film? Well, there's a lot of different ways to describe a sound designer and some are very broad and some are very specialized, but in the, the broadest sense of the word, a sound designer or a sound editor supervisor is responsible for all the audio elements in a film that are not music. Um, so they will edit the dialogue to make everything nice and smooth. That's the product, the original production sound. If they have to replace some of those lines, they'll edit those too. And then they'll add all of the sound effects and the backgrounds from wind and birds to cars and guns and spaceships and monsters. And then at the end, all of those elements are brought together for the final mix along with the orchestral or whatever type of music score it is and any songs that might be in the, in the film. And so you're basically having your hands in all of those areas or all those little subgroups that are more detailed talk about that later but that's basically what a sound designer does well i learned more like really the power of sound design during see what i'm saying of mixing not just mixing elements and bringing in wind and cars and things that would be there but uh, we actually have a segment and i was so blown away what uh, joe was able to do that it was one of my deaf actors, Robert DeMeo, was walking through New York City and uh, we filmed him just walking down the street, but it was New York, it was pre-pandemic. So, you know, there's a lot of noise that was happening. And I've known Robert for almost 30 years. So it's, uh, I have a pretty good sense and through many discussions with Robert had, and, and knowing what he was able to hear. And we, we did a lot of, discussion and talk and through that we were able to um, recreate uh, 
how Robert would experience New York City. And Joe is such a perfectionist and he did so much research and asked all the right questions and played and played until he had a, a, the sound design that completely blew me away. So you'll get to see a little bit example of what Joe does. So, um, hey, David, let's go to the screening room and let's roll the clip of a short scene from See What I'm Saying, um, sound designed by Joe Milner. Not bad, Jack. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm not around. A lot of teaching. And so, this is drama. Who's the teach? I don't, I can watch that scene. I have watched that scene a million times and I'm still so blown away by what you did there. Well, you were a huge part of that scene too, Hillary. I mean, I learned as much from you, you know, definitely just doing, doing that scene about how everything was going to be perceived. Cause it's not just making hold like that. It's, it's more than that. It's more selective and stuff. So you, you were really instrumental in making that scene happen. So Pat yourself on the back too. It was a collaborative effort. It definitely oh, collab. <laughs> oh, collab. <laughs> so, how does that normally work with directors? I mean, when they come in, how much influence on sound design do they have, and how much input do you have? Talk about the director collaboration. I, I would say that every director is different. Every film is different. Um, some films are very, what I like to just call objective, where it's the, the, the phrase is see a dog, hear a dog, see a car, hear a car, bang, bang, bang. You're just basically making sure that everything that a person thinks that they should hear, that they hear. You know, you don't necessarily need to hear the guy walking from 60 feet away unless it makes dramatic sense and then therefore you have to have that and then other things are very very subjective where like especially in the horror genre where you're talking about kind of these kind of drones and creaks and things like that or or you know i don't know what is the sound of a black hole you know i mean th those types of things and mm. so some directors you know, are very hands on and some are very hands off and they say, just do your thing. But then at the final mix, there's always going to be, it's never super straightforward. You're always going to be going, you know, I don't, that uh, just doesn't quite sound right. Can we try something different? Or, um, I mean, that gets into mixing of just think, you know, the music is too loud or the music is too quiet or the, the crowds are wrong or blah, blah, blah. But so, back to the to the beginning every film is different every director is different yeah so I've for lucky, people i've been lucky to work with some really great directors um i've never had a bad experience in all those movies so let's hope that continues <laughs> well that's a credit to you as well that people see and trust that you know what you're doing and that it's one of those things where you surpass like wild my wildest expectations and i always said you're my you know uh designer for life and the thing that 
also is interesting that you have a very rare skill where you design that you mix and you edit. And that's pretty rare for one person to have all the, can you explain the difference between the three for maybe our non-filmmakers who are watching? Yeah, I mean, it's not as rare as it used to be. And a lot of that is is just because of technology. Like in the old days, when you're editing sound, you had no way of mixing it because you were only listening to that one particular sound that you happened to be editing at the time. Um, and now with the digital systems, it started, you know, maybe 25 years ago, I think 1996, 97 was really where they first started using like Pro Tools, for instance. They had the Waveframe before that, but but it, it was in the 90s that we started moving out of editing sound on mag film and into digital. But um, sound editing, if we take it back into the, the pre-digital age, so it's more defined, um, basically is in into three groups you've got um dialogue i'm going to say three when i meant four um dialogue um hard effects backgrounds and foley um the dialogue is the production dialogue um that was recorded on the set and if there are ever reasons where they've got to re-record a line because it it you know, the microphone was in the wrong place or they're standing by the ocean or at an airport or it's just noisy and you want some really nice clarification. Well, then the actor will go back into a studio and watch that film and re-record that line. That's called ADR. Um, and they also do that with uh, with group, you know, being, bring in a group of people to do to do like sp very specific crowd sounds um, that you wouldn't find in like a, just a big cheer or something. So that's the dialogue side. And the sound effects side, um, as we said, with the, the backgrounds are Atmos, if you're in Europe, um, that's like wind and birds and oceans and street sounds and things like that. Um, then you have hard effects, which is like a, a gunshot or a telephone or a door close or a specific bird squawk. And then you have Foley, which is all the really detailed stuff, like all the little footsteps, all the little keys jingling. And those are actually performed kind of like the ADR person did when they were re-recording their line. All that, all the Foley stuff is performed to picture. So there's a Foley artist or artists in a studio and they're going, okay, uh, it's key jingle. And they'll go jing, 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 doing that to picture and every single footstep, um, we don't do coconuts, you know, for horses <laughs> very often. Anymore. We have a lot of great, a lot of great um, horse sounds in in our libraries now. But the Foley crew still can can take those things, and as we were talking about in sound design, making things more subjective, they can take big weights and go goom, 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 like that, and really give that give that sound some weight and that kind of feathers into sound design which to me is is more sounds that are like we said more subjective sounds that don't occur in nature um what is the sound of a spaceship what is the sound of a planet exploding what is the sound of a lightsaber or or an x-wing tie fighter or you know things like that if we want to get go down the star wars rabbit hole i mean just incredible sound design on on those films and and the original ones were done back in the days of mag they didn't have pro tools and computer editing systems it was all we're going to record this and then we're going to transfer it to a piece of film and then we're going to physically splice it and put it up and then here's your reel and <laughs> i i started kind of right at the end of that period like the last few films that were done on the studio lots in on mag was right when i was getting started 97 98 i think was i don't think in first film in 98 i don't think anybody was cutting on mag but 97 definitely so oh well, i've watched <laughs> Philly artists oh, way back way back uh the foley artists are so amazing and I know I think they've they've done short films about them and all the sounds you're right that they're watching and they're it's like amazing. mad scientists in a play box you mm -hmm. know in a sandbox that's amazing the work they do 
and and I've tried to do it, and I can't imagine. First of all, it's 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 really hard to do some of the most simple things, like even like if you're doing a handshake or something, to 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 make that sound nice and nice and warm and and firm versus going clack. It's a whole a whole thing. Mm-hmm. To do it just right. I mean, the artistry is just insane, and. Um, the amount of detail that they go through to cover an entire film, which you have to do because at the end, especially for a big studio picture, you have to provide a version that has no English dialogue in it so that they can dub it into all the different languages. So that means every little footstep, every little key jingle, every little whatever has to be recorded either via the sound effects editor or the Foley crew. So it's, thousands of individual cues it's it's amazing but when it's all in there (laughs) it sounds but it's (laughs) the one thing i remember is that we had one scene where our camera was a little bit far from our subject was an interview and i can't remember the reason why but the space was so quiet Mm -hmm. that and she was signing her answers but so there's no spoken dialogue and the Mm -hmm. whole thing was signed but there was no ambient sound. Mm, there was, you couldn't hear anything. And you had me do a cloth pass. Mm-hmm. And I didn't understand that of what that was. And it was, uh, I recreate, I signed along with her, but you could hear, oh. you know, the, the hands. Cause you, you were know, right, the- you were right up on the microphone. And so, so you, and you were probably one of the, one of the, a very small set of people who could have actually done that. Mm-hmm. Um, with any sort of like ease or <laughs> or um, uh, time efficiency, and yeah, you just you went up to the mic. You're watching her. You knew what she was going to say, and you're there doing doing the things. And so you could hear the little little hand hits and the cloth movement, and it totally brought that scene to life. Um, brilliant. Where you had a shirt that I put on, where it's just a you know when when you when a human moves in clothing, right. like I right. had never thought like oh yeah my clothes make sound if I'm moving my arms around. Yeah. But it was. Um, but when it's not there, it sounds weird. The lack exactly, of it sounds weird. Exactly. Exactly. It it sounds totally like it. It doesn't seem like it would until the sound completely cuts out. You don't really think that you're missing anything. And then you go, well, that sounds weird. Yeah, and and it, it's like, what's wrong? Yeah. Charlie. And, uh, I always I always say that the camera can zoom, but the microphone can't. Oh, please. So the idea of like, you know, shooting something from across the room, but zoom zoomed all the way in. Well, that's that's great. And I, I understand that there are reasons to do that, especially in documentaries where you're trying not to freak out your subject. Who mm-hmm. may already be super nervous or something but then if you've got the microphone 10 12 feet away too uh, it's yeah. not good there's no zoom on a microphone <laughs> there's no zoom on a microphone even on a zoom microphone anyway can i jump the in? other thing i love is your uh oh, is oh. your sound library i mean pouring through i mean there was one thing same thing we were filming an uh uh, we had a plane that was going like uh, that was being filmed from a window and it was taxiing at the airport. Mm-hmm. And you said, ah, oh, you know, we kind of need like a jet engine. And you must have had like 80 different idling jets. And I had to take a picture of it and send it to my friend Thomas, who's who will be on Hanging with Hillary, uh, who's a, a plane expert and he knows oh it's a blah 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 and i was like oh joe it's a blah 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 and you were able to go like found it <laughs> so that's awesome sounded- you know and 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 i appreciated that because like getting the the right sound to me sometimes the right sound is not always the best sound but if the sound is good i much prefer it to be the right one especially for documentaries and stuff and you know, you were asking about the director relationship. I'm not going to say who this was, because um, he's super famous. But there was a film that I did that had an airport scene, and they had a shot of the of the plane coming over to land, and the sound editors had had put in a, a perfectly good jet pass over and land, and we were at the mix, and the director said, 
because the director was a pilot and he goes no no uh, 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 uh. wrong sound and you're like what he goes well this this specific airport is this type of airport and that type of plane wouldn't land at this airport so what you're looking for is a whiz bang 2000 or whatever it was i don't know in the <laughs> whiz seven, bang. i love those 97 or <laughs> dc32 i don't know but anyway um it feels good to know it's right well exactly exactly you know even if you're the only one who knows maybe anyone else listening would be like sounds like an airplane but you know it's the right airplane uh, i'm one of those people that i just for me that that i sleep better at night <laughs> <laughs> When I was a little kid, my dad took me and my my little sister to an uh, album signing with William Shatner. Mm -hmm. He was signing his spoken word album called The Transformed Man. And mm -hmm. my sister's name is Anne or Annie. And where we get up to the little thing, it was at the bookstore in Seattle. And, and William Shatner said, you know, well, does she spell it with an I-E or just E? And my dad goes, oh, it's it's okay. It doesn't matter. And Shatner went, it will to her. Oh. Wow. Oh, oh, that's awesome. That's Captain awesome. Kirk. <laughs> Gotta love and, him. But yeah, so it, it does it does matter to get to get those things as right as you possibly can. That's a great story. That, that's what I love about your artistry is you you do care so much and you're like, well, let me just do another pass. Uh, but I think David, let's let's go ahead and show everyone our virtual studio set. Uh, let's move us in here. That and looks familiar. It looks familiar. What I see so, is every day. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe, explain what we're looking at here. This setup. It's and we'll see your setup in a minute in well, real life. But. You're looking at my my studio here at my house in Palm Springs and that's my board and behind me i guess is the screen um the speakers are behind the screen and up on the on the walls and then the two little speakers here in the in the front um i just finished a a mix for a film that's premiering at south by southwest called spring valley and since south by southwest is all online this year and virtual, it was, we did a stereo mix near field, you know, the smaller speakers instead of a big theatrical mix like we normally would, where we would go to a, a large scale mixing stage because you wanna mix the film in the environment that the film is going to be seen in, which in the case of film festivals up until COVID was in a movie theater. So this was a slightly different thing, mm. kind of more of like a TV type mix where you're doing a mix in a, in a still a big studio um but it doesn't it's not quite it's designed to play better on tv and on streaming services where there's kind of more background noise just because people are talking and walking around instead of sitting very quietly and watching a movie. but yeah um so this all those buttons and knobs control all the various tracks in my um, pro tools system and I can access any one of them just by pressing a button. And sometimes you've got, you know, over a thousand tracks and a lot of buttons. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, the nice thing about it is like once you learn one of those strips from the bottom to the top, you know them all. So uh, you, don't okay. really... <laughs> you just have to learn, learn them once. And, you know, you don't even have to use all of them if you don't want to. But they look cool. Should we All check right, out the real? I... Let's check out the real um, the studio ones? now. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, I didn't even have to look at you, David. You are ahead of me. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> if Joe, you want to move your camera, We're and doing... I just want to say to Tiffany in chat, Tiffany, love you. Thank you so much for liking how we set that up. That was so nice to say. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I was so absorbed. I always monitor the chat, but I was just engrossed in our interview today. Oh. Ready, ready um, for our tour? Oh, we're ready for, sorry, we're ready for our tour. So back in our little tour bus. Yay. We got kittens on the, <laughs> kittens, kittens on the top. So <laughs> Joe, uh, yeah, you can stay where you are, but just okay, um, okay. tell everyone what we're, what we're looking at here. Well, this is like the side view of, of what you saw. Um, and I don't know, our living room back there. <laughs> Did you clean for us today? It looks very clean. <laughs> I might have. 
<laughs> I might have done a little straightening. Um, the 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 window. I have a blackout shade um, on that door frame because in the afternoon the sun is so bright that it makes it so I can't even see the screen. So that's what that thing is to the right. Um, but, but yeah. But that console though. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Can you play pop? Nice. Can you play Pac Man on that thing? <laughs> <laughs> Only Space Invaders. <laughs> oh my God. See, now I'm eyeing your couch, Joe, because I know that's my spot, is like that's where I set up. And for those yep. uh, those of directors and producers out there who have sat in on sound stages and mix, you, you, you learn very quickly how important a good couch is because you're going to be spending many hours exactly. on it doing it. Exactly. Um, so let's let's get Joe back. I miss Joe. Let's get Joe okay. back okay. in. Yeah. And you know what I think? I think after all that, we're going to need a drink. So David, no I think idea. we should head to the bar and have some. Um... Wow, it's busy here. It's crowded. Let's <laughs> see. And and there's some. It's some music going too. Good mic night. Okay, I'm so happy you're here because uh, <laughs> you taught me the intricacies of Walla. So uh, uh, that's what you heard when we first came to this bar set for a couple seconds of the whole crowd that's there but not there. So Joe, can you tell tell all the lay people out there what is Walla? W A L L A. Well, Walla is the sound of groups groups of people talking. Um, or shouting or screaming or cheering. Well, cheering, that's kind of a subset and things like that. But they used to, they called it Walla because it sounds like Walla, 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 Walla. Um, I, I mean, I guess I don't really think it sounds like Walla, 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 but anyway. That's what it's for. Um, but and so there are what they call like library wallas that you've got in your sound library, um, which for this for this scene, for instance, like if we if we had people t sitting at the bar and talking talking to each other at the bar in this scene during production, even if there's a hundred people, nobody's saying anything. They're just mouthing the words because it's all about capturing the the principal dialogue. So it's very very quiet. And um, everybody's trying to be as careful as they can, putting the, their glasses down so it's so it doesn't go clunk like that right in the middle of somebody's word, which would then require them to probably find an alternate take of that one word to edit it in or come in and re-record the line. But so in this case, we would probably, as a, as a sound editor, I would add like a room tone just ventilation, just very, very quiet, maybe some outside traffic that would be going by. And then we would start building up the, the crowds themselves, adding like a layer of glass clinks. And, you know, you know, the crowd should be, they should be laughing more. They should be like, okay, so let's add some more laughs and things like that because they're telling a joke. And then maybe in the background of the shot, you might see the bartender talking to a couple of his his patrons, and he or she would be <laughs> doing like that. Okay, so in we talked about ADR where you're replacing where you're replacing lines of dialogue. Group ADR, they would bring in a set of of voice actors, and there's some fantastic ones that I've worked with. And they would do kind of a bed, a very kind of specific for this particular location. And then they would go, okay, so, uh, okay, there's a bartender back there and he's talking to the guy and the girl. So let's have the bartender, what, what do you think he's saying? Uh, okay, wh what can I get you? Okay, um, Tommy, come up here. You're gonna be the bartender, blah, 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 blah. And beep, beep, beep. Oh, what can I get you? <laughs> okay yeah that's good enough great that's cool and let's do a couple more takes of that and then so you put all those little details in that never even existed and i've been on um been on films where the director will have very specific things that they he or she wants the 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 people to talk about like okay these people are talking about the fight they had earlier these two people are talking about whether or not there are vegan options. 
um, these two people are talking about they've got to find another dog sitter or they're just going to go crazy. And <laughs> all of that stuff, you mix it all in and it just it just gives it it gives it life. And then the group people are also really good at like specific like chanting chant chant stuff or cheers like I don't have a sound effect in my library that little Billy and little league hits a single, but then he, he runs around the base and he falls down. I don't have that sound. Oh, David so, does. David, do you have your awe? Oh. No, this is the oh. whole sound. We have an awe. Yeah. But you need, you need, the a, you need the but yay like, and the it crack. Was, and it the... would be like, okay, Billy, Billy, swim, bada, 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 come on, Billy. Oh, yeah, Billy, Billy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> or something like that. See, I would be a terrible voice actor. But with the sound of the baseball hitting the the, the bat, and the of sound course. of it hitting the glove, and the foots, and the dirt, and that the crowd, kind of, and the yeah, yeah. The the foley artist would do would do the the all the footsteps. The sound editor would do the body fall. The sound mm. editor would do wow. the, the crack of the bat. There would also be the cheers, the bit just the basic cheers, but then the group. Um, the the group wall of people would be adding all the specifics for that that little that one little moment. Wow. Ooh, so, David, can you bring up the walla just for like oh. uh, three, five seconds? Just since we're talking about walla, yeah, I need to one sec. Let me go back here. I put you uh, on the spot here. We're going backwards. A good walla though. It's epidemic. Yeah. Epidemic sound is where, where I got that. It's good. It's got some good laughs. Yeah, we thought of we thought, you know, it's good for you bringing it out. All right. So we've got some questions in the chat. Thank you all for being patient. I'm usually better. It's monitoring, but I got so caught up in the conversation. So uh, Tiffany Josephs uh, has a question. She wants to know uh, how a sound editor can deal with perfectionism. Like at what point is the edit just have to be good enough? That's a great question, Tiffany. Um, <laughs> yeah, th there, there was a movie that I did. Um, it was pretty early on in my career and I was, I actually, I was the group ADR editor on, on this huge action movie. Um, so obviously there were just tons and tons of elements um and you're just there the we were on the the mixing stage and they're mixing away and mixing away and it was like three or four in the afternoon and the and the sound supervisor um who's an extremely talented man alan murray who um who just recently passed away he uh he turned to me and he goes i think it sounded better before lunch <laughs> and there is way you can you can mix the death out of something or you can you or the life out of something you can mix something to death by mixing the life out of it you know what i mean that um, works that works yeah 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 you can mix the death <laughs> um, that was good but but yeah but but that's <laughs> what can happen and and the the great thing about about a lot of a lot of films, especially studio films, is eventually no matter who you are, you either run out of time or you run out of money. Um, mm -hmm. So you try to make it as best you you possibly can, um, and oftentimes it becomes diminishing returns. But um, you know, if you work with good people, you're going to get something that 99% of the population is going to think is is just fantastic. And and so that's what you that's what you go for because you you don't want to get you don't want to get past it. That's that good answer? advice. Yeah, you're you're done when uh, the deadline when you have to turn it in. That's when you're yeah. done. Thank you for the question, Tiffany. Great question. Or, or when it's perfect. Uh, next. <laughs> or when it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they say yeah, films aren't done. You just stop at, just, at a certain yeah, point. They're abandoned. Yeah. yeah ex exactly. Exactly. Uh, the next question comes from my good friend, John Lawson, who is an editor and branching out to other areas of production, uh, who, who says that he edits his own, his own work and it sounds really good on set, but when he gets to post, there always seems to be a hum or static with, with at least one piece of dialogue. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, I, that may be more of a sound recordist job that's actually on set, but you're the one who has to deal with it when you get back hums right. and buzzes mixed in with dialogue. Any I think there's a second part of the question. If you read, he has a question on two oh, lines. It says, and, oh, you're, I'm thank you. And I'm never satisfied with the finish. Is there some magic just using quote unquote stock audio tools in Premiere Pro? To get thank rid of, to get rid of hum or buzz. There's always um, buzz in my stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. You had mentioned it was more the, the responsibility of the production sound mixer, but it's the post people who have to deal with it. I mean, and sometimes the production sound mixer has, it's not their fault. Um, the way that the set is lit or the way that the set, like in a, in a big action movie, like Titanic, for instance, 98% of that movie was re-recorded because the entire film is on this ship thing that's on a gurney that's going like so of course you're gonna have to re-record all of that but not that that helps you right now but um the the go-to in premiere pro i'm not really sure i mean what you're gonna want is like notch what we call notch filters um which can find a very specific frequency and just cut it out what you really want for stuff like that is isotope rx i mean i'm not gonna it, it's not a not a product placement but that's like the go-to audio restoration software for dealing with hums and buzzes and things like that um there are tons of plugins um that have got like notch filters and noise reduction things like that and um that you usually end up using a combination of three or four of them to get it sounding good. And sometimes it, it never sounds great. Sometimes there's no real saving it. And that's one of the things that is kind of a pet peeve of mine and why I never do this online is people will go, I've been watching the, you know, season two of blah, 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 blah. And wow, the sound is really bad. And they didn't do, I don't see, maybe they ran out of money or I don't believe that made the final edit. And it's like, dude, you have no idea what those people started with. Right. No idea. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was a guy, I wish I remembered his name. He was on one of my audio forums, but one of his quotes was, some of my best work sounds quite mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> because taking something from complete unusability mm -hmm. to resurrecting this one line of dialogue that it's like, look, the actor is gone. There's no chance, there's no money. Right. But, or, or it wasn't even, it wasn't even an actor. It was just this documentary that that they happened to catch somebody as they were walking by and they wanted it to try to save that little piece of dialogue no recreating um, it yeah there's no recreating that and and so the, that line of um some of my best work is quite mediocre um yeah you never know what what people start with but I, um yeah it's easy for me to talk about pro tools processes not so much premiere pro um but basically you want notch filters and noise reduction and do the best you can that's all any of us cross your do. fingers get, get yeah. good production sound get good production sound get good production sound. well that's i mean and that and that's the other thing a lot of people a lot of people they they spend a lot of time understandably um and they of time and expense on and care in choosing their cinematographer and their lighting and their DP and, and all these things. And you have to be as careful choosing your sound team as you were when you chose your photography team. The sound has to be in just as good a focus as the picture. Otherwise, people start watching it and they go, can't quite put my finger on it, but I don't like this. <laughs> doesn't it i'm not immersed in this process um and people go oh well it doesn't matter we'll just fix it in post and we'll do we'll adr all of that and blah 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 blah, blah. but right uh, there there are some great things that you can achieve with adr um but i think 99 percent of everybody involved would prefer that they got it on the day and that's a yes. collaboration between directors and cinematographers and sound people and all that kind of thing 
And John said, thank you for that. And now he's saying all he needs is just a lot of money to hire a pro or get better loves. So, <laughs> well, and, and love and love mics, those are tricky little buggers. Um, one little turn changes the sound completely. And of course, they're always subject to people hitting them mm -hmm. and scratching and stuff like that. And, and I, I will always go for the boom first. Um, but you don't always always have the have that luxury. So, well, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, and talk about your you journey. Just for the gear shift. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pull that up. Now, now, is it a Jaguar gear shift yeah, or is it more it's like a Jeep? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it to you. You're my designer, so it's. Uh, I would say it's an upscale but sporty kind of shift. Oh. Then I'll go with the done. Oh, nice, done. nice. Sold. <laughs> that was Your perfect. Job is done. You've just witnessed some Joe Milner of <laughs> sound design magic here live, impromptu. Just get on the uh, mic and do that. <laughs> Who needs now, the sound Joe, files? <laughs> <laughs> now, Joe started. Uh, you started as a musician, um, which a were a lot. And so, talk about that. How did you even get into sound design? Um, it was purely a fluke. Um, like you just said, I, I started as a, as a musician playing piano in, in high school, and then I became a singer and I was a musician for a while and um, had a performance career, a brief one, but then really was more interested in, in being in the studio and, and learning engineering and, and production and arranging. And then uh, I was working at a studio and I cut uh, just finished this assyrian acid jazz hip-hop album <laughs> and yeah in a in a not syrian but assyrian um by an artist named nova up in uh, turlock and this was in the early days of pro tools and i kind of taught myself to kind of use pro tools and um had to cut cut everything together blah 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 but fast forward fast forward out of the blue i got a call from the head of the, the biggest sound independent sound house in the in the business called sound deluxe and they were doing a big book on tape version of a movie that they had done and i i guess they were looking for people who could use pro tools because that was new at that company at that time and i said to this man who had won at least one academy award already um well I've only used Pro Tools for music, but like with sound effects, you just like kind of drag it like until it's in sync, right? <laughs> and he goes, I mean, yeah, I guess. And I went, well, I could do that. <laughs> I had no clue, no clue whatsoever what I was doing. I just thought all those car crashes and car chases and gunfights were just from a really good production sound mixer and boom operator just catching it all. And wow, it's amazing how you can hear those, just his footsteps and just his spurs in the midst of all this cacophony. That's amazing. So little <laughs> did I know. Yeah, um, but that's that all on you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm looking at, at these cue sheets where he had to write down what sounds for the re-recording mixer to, to mix. And I'm like, what's a re-recording mixer? <laughs> so yeah i was really 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 lucky it's it's just a fluke but um yeah that's how i got it yeah, i'm gonna it. argue awesome. with that uh not just a fluke because david if you want to widen it out we're gonna show uh joe here as a musician uh first uh let's show him um as a do you do you have, let's pull up the one of him as a boy playing the piano so Aww. that's Aww. young joe at the piano to show like you had music going through you from a very <laughs> young age and then you grew up in the 80s like one does to look something like this oh <laughs> now that's crazy who would want to walk around looking like that <laughs> i was i was i was trying to look very uh very... handsome intense <laughs> well, I now i knew you had this look but i never understood why until we started doing the tech for uh hanging with hillary this week 
where uh, you weren't just a performer, you were an incredible performer where we actually found a clip of you performing at the World Cup in Milan with the Giorgio Moroder uh, band who produced Donna Summer and a whole bunch more, which we'll talk about in a minute. But to get the full impact of Joe's musical career before he started becoming a sound designer, uh, let's go to the screening room and roll a little short clip of Joe performing at the World Cup. <laughs> if, if you missed the 80s anyone out there missed the 80s that was it that was the 80s was right it. there a lot of hair yeah that was uh 30 years ago now 31 almost 31 yeah wow that was no, fun 80 oh yeah oh, well that was 1990 so technically those were the 90s but barely but barely yeah. 1990 like, was still the 80s Guns and roses was just about to come out <laughs> you look yeah and yeah it's, they missed out for not um casting or, or no guns and roses without but grunge was just about to start yeah we were about what to get nirvana after that and they're like so if you're a pearl jam i'm like oh uh oh <laughs> and then it was um, so now Giorgio composed for Flashdance, Top Gun, Midnight Express, Donna Summer, and The Never Ending Story. And Joe, you sang on the sequel for that, yes? I did. I did. It was it was about six months after the, the World Cup opening thing that you just saw. And um, The Never Ending Story was a huge success in the early 80s. And Limal from Kaja Gugu had sang the original the original title song and Giorgio had written the score for the sequel he wasn't going to write the score but they wanted him to put in like three more songs one of them being the theme and then two uh, two other ones and so he hired me to sing and so we recorded them and um that went you know it went fine and then I'm sitting at the at the Four Seasons Hotel with Giorgio and the producer um, of the film, and they're saying, "Okay, so Joe, you fly to Berlin, you do an interview with Popcorn Magazine, which is like the Tiger Beat or something like that, the Teen Magazine. You do an interview with them. You fly to, to for Berlin to the premiere." And then you fly to Vienna for the premiere, then you fly home, then a few weeks later, the movie will open in London, and then in Paris and in France, and so blah, 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 Australia, blah, 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 you know, wow. Scandinavia, Japan. So we're thinking we're probably going to need you for a year of promotion. And I'm sitting there going, it's my, in my tiny apartment over on Raleigh Street <laughs> in LA, um, going, I'm going to, if this is happening. I'm going to be a rock star <laughs> really happening. You had the and look, you had the hair. So, you know, the limo comes and picks me up and blah, blah, blah. And I go to, 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 I do the Berlin thing and I do the Vienna thing and came back and the movie was released and the movie kind of sucked <laughs> and the movie died and oh. they called me and they said, yeah, um, yeah, the thing about it, I don't think we're going to need you for that year of, uh -huh. of promotion. And uh. I went and got my old job back as a Honda car mechanic in Santa Monica. Uh -huh. um, so you went from the World Cup to being back uh, a car mechanic. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. the, the, the job that I had left kind of haughtily, like, I'm going to go be a rock star. <laughs> and for that 
for that long. <laughs> My seven and a half minutes, I, I, I was. But then it ended, and then I, I had to make a living, so I went back to my job, um, took all the stick, as they would say, um, from my coworkers that was pretty well, pretty deserved. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, pretty, uh, yeah. Anyway, but that was like the best <laughs> life lesson I've ever had. It's like, you have to appreciate what you've got while you've got it, because it could end like that. Yep. And don't be a jerk to people because yeah. you're going to be right back where, you know, like they always say, the people that you meet on the way up, you meet them on the way back down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's be a that. good person. That's that so thing. You had to that's come. That never ending story. <laughs> <laughs> that ends back, you know, with wrenches and. Yeah. Wrenches and. Hydraulic and lips. Bars on my hands. Yeah. The, the ended oh. story. Yeah, the end, the ending story. <laughs> I was like, how could they make a sequel to the never ending story? The first one has to end for you to start the second one. Exactly. And no exactly. wonder they well, had problems. A third one, and I, I believe actually a fourth one. And and there are a few people. It was it was weird. Out of the blue, I got a, an Instagram comment um, today on one of my little piano videos, <laughs> and this this young man said. This is amazing, and your work on the Neverending Story Two is amazing. Uh. The, the the theme and the song "Heaven's Just a Heartbeat Away" are on my playlist constantly. And I'm like, uh. wow. <laughs> or or just just. It's a good feeling. I've, I've, yeah, I've had that like maybe three times in 30 years, so I'm doing pretty good. You're doing but, great. But, but some really nice people saying really nice things about that movie. And, and it, it seems to have resonated with, with people, even though it didn't have the, the big success that the other ones did. You, you know, know, but that's the journey that I love talking about. It's like, then you went on to go ahead and work on 155 films. So on the civics. It, oh, wait, movies. <laughs> <laughs> so it turned out okay. But uh, for I, I want to show you off a little bit. Uh, you just mentioned your piano work. So I remember, um, I think it was mixing my second film. You're like, I just, I haven't played the piano that much over the years, but I'm taking it back up again. And you started practicing and I was like, you were good. But then like you dove in head first and like, you're incredible now. And I want to be able to show, uh, show a little bit. And Joe practices all the time. Like I'll text him and he'll be like, I'm practicing, but when I'm done, I'll get back to you. So <laughs> this is what happens when you practice, practice, practice. David, let's roll a little bit of Joe playing the piano. Good cheer sound. It's a good one. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So I read a quote well, recently. Someone said, listening to Beethoven, when you listen to Beethoven, Beethoven shows you what it feels like to be Beethoven. And when you listen to Mozart, Mozart shows you what, is, what it feels like to be Mozart. And when you listen to Bach, Bach shows what it feels like to be the universe. And as someone who likes Bach, I'm, you know, baby steps, I'm, I'm a beginner, but mm -hmm. I love that quote. I don't know if it's true, but I love it. <laughs> It's a great quote and and Bach was he was super underappreciated in his lifetime. I mean, he he obviously wrote a huge catalog of music, but he after he died, he um he really kind of faded almost into obscurity and it wasn't 
until uh, I believe it was Mendelssohn. God, seriously, you can't remember this? <laughs> but um, someone in the chat, help us out. Does, does someone, yeah, does someone, it's either Mendelssohn or WC. Mendelssohn, I'm almost positive it was Mendelssohn, basically brought, brought Bach back. <laughs> There's a Schwarzenegger quote in there somewhere. Bach, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll be back. Yeah, yeah, I'll be back. Anyway, um, and oh and God. now, um, now he's everywhere, and people like Chopin always specified. You know, I play an hour of Bach every day, and that's the foundation for all music. Chopin was a huge fan of Bach, and if if it hadn't been for well, it's definitely Mendelssohn because Debussy was a um, contemporary and, and later than Chopin, so. I'm going to go with Mendelssohn. I'll go with Mendelssohn. <laughs> 25. I'll so I, I, start, I start with Bach in the morning as well. Wow. Um, I'm working on um, uh, part of his partita and a uh, couple of the pieces from the well-tempered clavier. Um, the only one to know is I'm working on the little fugue in G minor, uh, oh, cool. on a, a guitar version oh, of wow. it. And oh. But I have to sight read it, though, because... It's one thing if, if you learn a rock and roll, a rock and roll, if you're working back in black, you know, ACDC, learn the mm -hmm. chorus, learn the verse, you know, the whole song with yeah. Bach, it just goes and goes and goes. It never comes back and repeat. I don't know. I, it looked like you weren't sight reading. It looked like you remember. Well, that was Beethoven, but still classical music is so hard to memorize. It, yeah, I, I, I can, I can memorize pretty good, but it's weird. Like that piece I learned when I was 13 mm. wow. and it, has stuck more or less in my head for now 45 years. Um, but there are pieces that I learn now where I'll work them up, I'll learn them, I'll memorize them, I'll play them, I'll make my little Instagram video or whatever, and a week later, uh, I can't play it. It just, it doesn't stick in my head the way it used to. So when I was early. taking piano lessons out here, if I if I was talking, you know, leaving the lesson and a, and a teenage, pianist was coming in i would i would say look learn all the repertoire you can right now because your brain <laughs> is soak it in and it's yeah. going to stick later on eh. that's why they teach <laughs> kids little language or languages and skills yeah it's yeah very yeah exactly exactly all right so on hanging with hillary uh we get to ask our guests what their happy place is if they could be anywhere on earth and we've given you hints throughout the entire show of where joe's happy place is right now they're hanging out above the uh the the screen there they're kind of watching everything uh so uh david let's go to joe's happy place at the catio oh look at them <laughs> yay <laughs> So the reason we did this is uh, Joe um, and his partner, Laura, um, have been doing incredible work doing animal rescue and cat rescue. Uh, if you could bring up a picture of Joe, yeah, with his rescue. So tell us a little about your work with animals here, Joe. Um, well, when we lived in um, LA, we lived in a, in a big movie theater where we mixed your films, Hillary. Mm -hmm. Um, and that neighborhood was not a neighborhood that was really keen on spaying and neutering. Um, kind of much like, like the neighborhood we live in now, <laughs> for, for that matter, because we, there's still plenty of work to do out here. Um, but yeah, like cats started appearing and we started adopting them. And then there was, there were like three sisters and one we couldn't catch. And it took like before she had had two separate litters before we were finally able to trap her. And so we would have like maybe five kittens and we would adopt out three and there would all be, always be a couple left over. And it's like, well, now we're attached to them. Now we're going <laughs> to blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Eventually at one time we were taking care of 20 cats. <gasps> wow. Um, and about that time, um, through Laura's connections um, with, with her work, we got involved with um, an animal rescue organization in Los Angeles called Saving Grace LA. And um, I volunteered to just work at, the, at their catio, uh, which involved going in and feeding the cats and changing the water and changing the litter boxes and socializing with them. And then every weekend they were going out um, 
um, Paulie and Nelia and Angie Rubin, who I think you know, um, going out to uh, to the and Karen Rose, of course, going out to the um, to Larchmont Village to try to adopt out the cats. And so that's how we first got involved. And then when we moved to Palm Springs, I, th I think people cats just know that we're suckers and they just <laughs> kind of show up. Um, so all oh, yeah. of a sudden, great, there's two kittens and we got to trap them. We got to take them in the Palm Springs animal shelter that I'm wearing the, this shirt for. Um, it's fantastic because there are no kill shelter, unlike a lot of the shelters in LA. Um, so there's never any real worry that the cats are going to be euthanized, but what they have, they have a fantastic TNR program, which is trap, neuter and return. So, um, in this case, with those two kittens that you saw in the picture, those two were young enough to where we trapped them, we brought them in, and they were spayed and they were adopted out. Uh -huh. um, they're they're, so but it's but it's really quick because with, there are another three that look a lot like that, but they were just kind of over the age limit. Oh. And so those ones, we trapped them, they neutered them, and they returned them here. So now they're out in our front yard getting two square meals a day and water and attention, but they're not our cats because that would be crazy. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I want to show what you have done. So David, can you bring up a picture of the, of Joe and Laura's catio? Yeah. We, we just, he just says catio and we're just all acting like we, we've all, oh, everyone has a catio. That's not a new word. A let's see. Let's see what catio. a catio really is. Oh, there's and me. so they built this enclosure in uh, that's part of their house, so the cats can have. Uh, there you go. That's you can get a better view, and you can see it's incredible. Like I would live in your catio. <laughs> like it's gorgeous there. Uh, that they're safe from predators because it's all enclosed, but they get to be outside because they're feral, right? Um, yeah, I mean, some of them. Some of them, I have. I've had. There's one cat there that um, we've had, I think, 11 years now, and I've never held her. Mm. She's, she's just, I mean, she's sweet. Um, that's, that's Mila, the one that's sitting on the cat tree. And so I think sweet. that's um, Christina in, in the background, um, right underneath her, the, both the white cats. And Christina is the, the mom of four of our other cats. So, but she's just very, very cool, very, very calm and everything like that. Um, but like the, since it gets, it gets really hot in Palm Springs, obviously we also have misters. Um, so they live at Disneyland basically. So they live at Disneyland, yeah. <laughs> so like we turn, we turn on the, we turn on the misters um, every funny. time it gets above like 103, oh which my is, gosh. it will basically from May till October. Um, and that cools them down, but they also can come in the house, of course, and they have, um, uh, their own like climate controlled room as well. So they've got heating and stuff like that because we have friends who are allergic, so we can't uh, have them go across, across the whole house, mm -hmm. uh, but they're it's adjacent to our bedroom and stuff like that. So we have our own little kind of private cat, cat zone. And then the, the friend zone, not that's well See, it's, that's a, I mean. <laughs> that's a, it's a different friend, kind of friend zone. I put our friends in the friend zone. <laughs> it's a different kind of friend zone. Yeah, yeah that, but it's definitely not, a, not your not cats. A, they're not in no. the whole house, so they're not your cats. They're just yeah, part yeah. of. They're guest cats. Yeah. Guest cats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, so we have our cats <laughs> inside and in the catio, and then the front the front yard cats, and, <laughs> and then the and, butler. And we'll just see randoms, and it's like, oh my god, here we go again. <laughs> As you try to trap them and then some cats that you've already trapped go in the trap again and you're like wow thanks a lot <laughs> ruined a night of trapping but uh, we got it we got to stem the tide otherwise yeah it's just too many well yeah, so you do we good do. work so thank you and i'm sure the cats thank you also for no all they don't <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in their in their own cats. way in their own way <laughs> Well, they, just by being uh, cats, they're thanking us. On, on behalf yeah. of the, the cats, I thank you and Laura for the work. You're, you're very doing. welcome. 
So David, I can't believe that our show is um, wrapping up here. So I think this is a fun uh, one. I know and it's been such a treat and I know you were nervous beforehand, but I'm still nervous. You're, you're so much fun to talk to and you've done so much and we've only, I know I could, we're going to have to have you back because we've got so many more stories and uh, of things that you have done and you've had an incredible career and love life. It. So this has been, I love treat. it. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun and, and, for everyone who asked questions, thank you for the questions. And thank you for the questions. Yes, let's give Joe a crowd. round of applause. See, see, that's what it would look like on the set <laughs> until you add the sound effect. <laughs> see a bunch of people going. And and the way it just cuts off like that seems sounds very natural. Yeah. Oh, totally. very natural. Yeah. <laughs> Wish we knew a sound designer it could help. Like. Uh, <laughs> oh. Talk to them. <laughs> well thank you all um if you're still watching we appreciate you and tune in next week to see tate tollier who is an incredible photographer who's done tub time with tate you can hear all about that subscribe um and hit notify when we go live so you never miss a show so thank you again joe for being here david Come back on here for one more moment. I want to say thank you for making all the magic happen and making it so seamless. And all the kittens, kittens in the corner for every set that <laughs> got kittens on the couch, kittens on the corner. And Joe, thank you again so much for hanging with me. It's so good to you see you. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me. It was really fun. Yay. Yay. Thank you. So until next time, until next week, take care, be well, forward and share the video. But we're out of here. Thank Bye. you all. Goodbye. Mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs>